silence of a heart that believes itself defeated by loss, by pain, by fear. Our hope nailed to a cross, our own faith depleted at the sight of no movement, a body inert. But it is not the end. The sound of the gravestone rolling, a new story has unfolded. Death has been defeated. Our hope is alive. Jesus is alive. We raise our hands in victory. By his resurrection, we are set free. He blows a wind of life and brings us back to the light. He is risen. Our Messiah is alive. He breathes and the darkness trembles. He speaks and our future shines. By His sacrifice we are now saved. By His grace we can all rise. Here rejoicing in the sky. The grave could not hold Him. The veil has been torn. Our Christ has won over death, over sin, over ache. By His power all chains break. He is victorious. He is the way. He is the resurrection and the life. And by His wounds, we're made alive. Will you stand and declare these words with us this morning? I believe there is one salvation one doorway that leads to life one redemption one confession i believe in the name of jesus christ i believe in the crucifixion by his blood i have been set free i believe in the resurrection Oh, great. 
Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Let's try one more thing. I forgot to do in the first service, but I think you picked it up. I did. Afterwards. Thank you for that, by the You're way. You're welcome. I don't uh, want anyone to go home disappointed. No, no, no. Not yeah, at all. Yeah. Not at all. The snacks were delicious, by the way. Um, anyways, so Easter in the church, we there's often a phrase said and starts by saying, he is risen, and it's followed with, he is risen indeed. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Great. Now that I've made a fool of myself, my name is Jake. I'm one of the pastors and excited to have you with us. We're a church, Warm Beach is a church where we want to build kingdom minded relationships as we call and equip every generation to live like Jesus. And one of the best ways to do that is to, is to get to know each other. And, and there's a lot of you and a few of us. And one of the best ways, the easiest ways for us to get to know you and for you to be able to share with us what's going on in your life, how we can be praying as a staff for you, is these connect cards that you see in the seat backs in front of you and on the screen as well. Um, and this gives us a chance to get to know who you are, how to get in touch with you. And then on the back side is a place for you to share prayer requests or if there's anything that we can know or should know to help or to come alongside you, we, we want to get to know you as much as possible. And so we'd love for you to take some time to fill these out if, if you can. And then yeah, um, you can put it in the offering box by the doors on your way out afterwards. And we hope that you were able to pick up uh, sermon notes, not so much because it's riveting, but it is, because I did it, but on the back side of the sermon notes are just some of the things that are happening in our church, and we've got highlighted here our kids' ministry, our student ministry, and of course our group ministries, and there's more things happening, but we really want to make sure that you know uh, some of the various things that are going on. And, and for teens, if you, if you call one of the teens either here or in your home your own, sometimes I know as a parent we, we like to not, but if you, if you say that it's my kid and they're not signed up for our retreats, we have uh, high school, thank you, right on cue, high school and junior high uh, retreats coming up in the next week. And so there's still time to sign up for those things. Just uh, scan the QR code on the youth graphic and you'll be uh, get, able to get information for that. But we want to make sure that you know about the various things happening in the life of our church. You didn't introduce yourself. Oh, I'm, I'm Morgan. I'm one of the other pastors on staff. It's good to see you. So. I totally forgot too. There, that's so, right. Anyways. Go ahead. Well, why don't you take a moment and just say hi to the people around you and we'll continue our worship service. Victor! 
Son will bow before the King of Kings, O oh God, forever we will sing. Oh, behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands, Jesus, you will reign.
praise you because we worship you, Lord, with confidence, knowing that the cross is, is empty, the tomb is emptied, and Lord, you are alive. And we can praise you knowing that salvation is at hand and available to each and every one of us. I pray, Lord, that as we continue to worship, as we get into your word, as we continue this time, Lord, I ask that you would be present here in this place with us. We thank you for your presence here with us. And we ask, Lord, that as, as we continue on, that you would be drawing us closer to you, that, Lord, we would uh, be, be open and ready to receive whatever it is that you have for us. We give you praise, Lord, for loving us, for going to the cross on our behalf and then declaring victory over sin by raising from the dead. I pray, Lord, that that would not just be something we, we think about and worship and celebrate today, but that would be a reality for us each and every day as we go forward. We pray your blessing over this time, Lord, and we thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Jesus is alive. Happy Easter. Um, we are not who we were. Jesus is calling us into something new, and we don't have to live in darkness anymore. Isaiah forty three nineteen says, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Jesus is doing a thing right now. Not in a week, not in a year, not when you or I get our lives figured out. He's doing it right now, and he wants to make us new right now. Colossians 3 says to take off our old selves with our sin and shame and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the image of our creator. Jesus' death saved us when we were dead in our sin, but it's his life that renews us, restores us, and reconciles us. Mm -hmm. Abby and I are going to sing a song called Grave Clothes, and it reminds us of just that, that we let go of who we were so Jesus can make us new and mold us into who he created us to be. We can leave our old, sinful, dirty, dead selves in the grave and step in into the new life that we have in Jesus. Will you worship in your hearts with us this morning? Tired of hiding, dead man's awakening, old life behind me, morning is breaking, you're calling me out, just as I am, filthy now holy, your spirit inside me, graves into glory, reviving what's dying, you're calling me out, just as I am, death to life you'll be glorified in the stone you're moving is proving your might i'm letting go i'm leaving my grave clothes the stone behind me real love before me breath in this body Sinking in glory, oh, you've called me out Just as I am, death to life You'll be glorified in the stone You're moving, is proving your might I'm letting go, I'm leaving my grave And my soul was sleeping, awakened to life We dance in your freedom, I'm dressed in your light I'm letting go, I'm leaving my grave clothes. Come and see, He's awakening. He is calling the grave back to life. Come and be glorified in the stone you're moving is proving your might i'm letting go 
I'm leaving my grave and my soul was sleeping, awakening to life. I dance in your freedom, I'm dressed in your light, I'm letting go, I'm leaving my grave clothes, my grave clothes, I'm leaving my grave clothes, my grave clothes, I'm leaving my grave clothes. clothes. Happy Easter. I think what I love so much about what they just did was this wasn't just, you know, performance that they did. This comes from who they are, that they have left their grave clothes, and Jesus has given them new clothes to wear. And uh, I'm so proud of both of you, Abby and, and Danielle, and just the work that God is doing and continuing to do in your lives. And, and thank you for using your gifts for his church and for his kingdom. Uh, it's just an awesome blessing. Sorry, I'm a dad, so, uh, you know... <clears throat> unscripted moments, I guess, but uh, yeah, there we go. When I was in college, I had a friend, still a friend of mine, his name's Tim, and Tim's uh, grandfather passed away. And in Canada, we do these things called wakes. I know that they sometimes happen here, but it's basically a viewing. You go and you, you pay your respects to the family and the, the body is there and you walk through and, you know, it's not generally a, you know, a, a hip hooray type of time. It's very solemn, very quiet. And, and Tim was having a rough day and, and I said, Tim, what's going on? He said, well, my, my grandfather passed away and I have to go to his wake on Friday. And I looked at him and I said, well, do you, do you want me to come with you? And he said, you want to come to my grandfather's wake? You've never met the guy. And I said, I know, but I've got nothing to do, and I'd love to, you know, be there for you. And so he said, sure, that would be awesome. So, so Tim and I, we went to his wake, and Tim has a rather large family. And after we had gone through the line and paid our respects, we and the rest of the grandkids, all like 5,000 of them, were sitting off on the side. And, and we were just, you know, just sitting, passing the time. And, and Tim's a drummer. And if you know any drummers, you know all they need is just a, a moment of time and it starts coming out in them, right? And, and so before long, Tim, he, he, had a, he had a beat going in his head and then it, it slowly migrated from his brain down to his feet and then out to his hands. And then eventually it started coming out of his mouth. And, and this was the beat that I heard that Tim was, was laying down at his grandfather's wake, he was going, doom, 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 and I looked at him, and I said, Tim, what are you doing, and he goes, I'm just, I said, Tim, you're, you're singing another one bites the dust at your grandfather's wake, what are you doing? And the horror just washed over his face, and then it was replaced by laughter. And he said, if you know my grandfather, if you knew him, you would know that this is not what he would want for right now, because he's with Jesus. He's won. Like, he's, he's the winner. He's not dead. He's alive. And, and he, it, it just erupted into to just so much fun, and we... I, the honorary grandkid, and all the other grand, we actually got in trouble at this wake because we were having a party and nobody else was. Nobody else got the memo that this was actually a time of celebration, not a time of mourning and grieving. And, and here's the deal is that when people pass away, it is so hard, isn't it? It's so hard to know how to process all those feelings and emotions. And on, on one level, yes, we, we mourn and we grieve because, because they're not with us any longer. And I don't want to take away from that at all. But for those who know Jesus, for those who have received the forgiveness of Jesus in their lives, for those who have made the commitment to give their lives over to him, to give control over to him, when they pass away from this life, like, they are the winners. They get to experience life in its fullness. They get new bodies free of disease and hurt and pain and, and everything else. And, and Jesus was no different from this. And yet, when people pass away, we struggle sometimes to know, like, how are we supposed to respond in those situations? And Easter, Easter, isn't that, that we go from Good Friday, literally two days ago, mourning and grieving to a time of celebration, right? Why? Because there is no grave on this earth where the bones of Jesus are laying. Let me say that again. There is no grave on this earth where the bones of Jesus are laying in. Amen. Thank you, Samuel. Why? Because he's not there. 
He's alive. He is risen. He's risen indeed. Okay, Pastor Jay, we got to do some work here, okay? Let's try this again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Now, you might be visiting. You might be here because your mom made you come or because your spouse, like, elbowed you and said you have to be here. You might be here because you're a kid. You might be thinking the only way I get to the Easter egg hunt is if I go to church. It doesn't matter. This is something we do. And for some of us, we don't feel like we've gotten the full effect of Easter until we say that phrase, like, 59 times right? And so let me, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. That's the whole reason we're here. It's the whole reason why we're doing this. It's the whole reason why we get to be here is because Jesus is not dead somewhere. He is alive. He is on the throne next to God, the father, and he is interceding on our behalf. And we're here to worship him. Someone said Easter really shouldn't be different than any other Sunday. They're right. Easter shouldn't be different than any other day. Because every single day, Jesus is alive. Every single day, Jesus is calling people to him. And this morning is just an opportunity for us as a church to recognize, remind ourselves that Jesus has already done the work. He's calling us to him. And it doesn't matter why you're here. It doesn't matter how much you've been guilted into being here. You have an opportunity this morning to experience the life that he has for you. And the thought that I hope that you will walk away with this morning, as you go into the rest of your days, enjoy this beautiful weather, and do things with your family and friends and so on, is that you will take away this one thought at this this Easter uh, season. And that is this, is that Jesus takes away the empty and fills it with life. Jesus takes away your empty and fills it with life. Some of you are sitting here this morning empty. Some of you are experiencing a level of emptiness in your life that you have no words for. You might look good on the outside, you might have a smile on your face, but deep down inside you're experiencing a level of emptiness that nothing and no one has been able to solve for you. And I want to tell you this morning, the good news is that Jesus can. Jesus can get to the heart of who you are and he can pull that emptiness out and he can replace it with a joy and with a love and with life that he has for you. And this morning, as we spend some time looking at Matthew chapter 28 and we read some verses of a very familiar story, my hope is, is that you will hear Jesus calling to you saying, I am here to take away your emptiness and to fill it with life. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. This story in Matthew chapter 28 is is the story that comes after Jesus has already died on the cross and has been laid to rest in the tomb. And it is a story that is filled with examples of how Jesus takes away the empty and fills it with life. And starting in verse 1, it says this, After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary uh, Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were also afraid of him, and they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not risen, he is not here, he is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Have you ever read or been reading through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the accounts of the life of Jesus, and thought, how many Marys are there? Like, how many Marys can there possibly be? In this story alone, we have two Marys. I mean, what are the odds of that? There are six to be exact. There's Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary of Bethany, Mary of Clopas, Mary, the mother of John Mark, and of course, the two Marys mentioned here in this passage, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and Mary Magdalene. We also have a challenge with names here at Warren Beach Church, We have two Dave Millers, Dave Jr. and Dave Sr., and they're not related at all. 
We have Matt Lambert, Matt Fenton, and Matt Daniels, who was just up here on the stage playing bass. We have two Jonathans on our board. We've had to rename them, Jonathan and John. They don't get a choice in it, but we have to know how to differentiate the two of them on a board of seven people. And we have almost as many Susans and Susans as there are Marys in the Gospels. It's easy to get confused when it seems like every other woman mentioned in the Gospels is a Mary. But this Mary has both a unique and very normal story. You see, Mary Magdalene, her story includes the uniqueness and the normality of being saved by demons and giving a new purpose. The uniqueness of Mary Magdalene's story is that she suffered from demons. Not just one or two or three or four, but seven. But the normal part of her story is that she needed a savior. Listen to Luke chapter 8 when it says that Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, the 12 disciples. And, some, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom the seven demons had come out. While it's not specifically mentioned here, the common thought is that Jesus was the one who healed Mary of her demons. The fact that Mary had seven demons shows the severity of her situation. But Jesus didn't just empty her of her demons and leave her alone. No, he then filled her with the life of being reconciled back to God and becoming a part of his ministry. Following her healing, Mary devoted her life to Jesus through her support and care of his ministry. In fact, Mary was one of a very few people who was present for every step of the journey Jesus took to the cross. Mary had been the one that had accompanied Jesus to Jerusalem as he rode in on a donkey. She was there, witnessed his crucifixion from a distance. She also observed the tomb where his body had been laid in position to rest. And Mary was also the one that went to the tomb early on Easter morning, only to find that the body of Jesus wasn't there. Luke chapter 8 tells us that some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many of the women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Mary played a hugely significant role in the life and ministry of Jesus. Mary also suffered from demons. And Jesus came into her life not just to free her from the demons, but to fill her with his presence and salvation If Jesus was able to empty Mary of her demons and give her new life, then he can surely take away any of yours and my emptiness and fill us with new life. You see, Mary is a story that shows just the lengths that God is willing to go to. Mary is a story of how powerful Jesus is and how all-consuming he can be to remove the stuff that causes us emptiness and refill it with himself. Mary Magdalene was saved from demons and given a new purpose, and God is calling us to also be redeemed and and relieved of the emptiness that's inside us to receive his life. A second part of the story that shows us how Jesus fills the empty is the stone. See, the stone was rolled away to let the women in. An earthquake, an angel of the Lord with the appearance of lightning and white snow, and a stone rolled away. We find this angel sitting on the stone, presumably waiting for the Marys. By the way, I'm just going to refer to them as the Marys from this point forward, waiting for the Marys to arrive. I picture this amazing heavenly creature triumphantly sitting on the stone, which we should actually think of as a massive boulder, not just a stone that we would use to skip on a body of water, swinging his legs back and forth, enjoying the sight of himself. I've seen some of our junior high guys. I can just imagine if they were appointed to be the angel to come down and roll the stone away. They wouldn't just roll the stone away and then go and hide. No, they'd roll the stone away and sit there and wait so people could see what they had done, right? I I just picture this as this is the the angel that God sent. Most seeing this sight would assume that the reason for the stone being rolled away was to make it possible for Jesus to escape 
either in his own power or with the help of others. But Jesus didn't need the stone to be rolled away to escape the tomb. His resurrected body would no longer forever again be confined by such things. Jesus had stared down death on the cross and rose victorious over the grave. No, the stone was rolled away so the Marys, grieving from the loss of their rabbi and friend, could enter the tomb and discover that Jesus was not dead, but alive. The stone was rolled away, not so so someone could get out, but so that we could look in. The stone was rolled away to show us the emptiness of the tomb didn't mean emptiness, but meant life. And the third thing that we see here in the story is the empty tomb itself. You see, because the empty tomb confirmed the eternal promise of God's complete redemptive plan. The empty tomb signifies that what God did is whole and complete. God's plan from the very beginning has always been to share life with you and I. God created us so that we might be in communion with us. One of my favorite verses from Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is when, when it speaks of God coming down in the cool of the day to walk with Adam and Eve. I mean, doesn't he have better things to do than to do that? But that's why God created us, is so that he could be in communion with us. But everything changed when sin entered the world. And even though it entered through Adam and Eve, God's plan never changed. God knew that he would need to send his son, Jesus, to be the perfect and ultimate sacrifice for our sin. Jesus would be the only way for you and I to have this emptiness inside our lives filled with the life that God wants for us. There is no other way. And the empty tomb proves that God's redemptive plan is complete. Listen to what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, For you know that it was not with the perishable things such as silver or gold that you have been redeemed from the, from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. God had a plan to save us ever before we were even created. God was not surprised by the sin of Adam and Eve. He was not surprised by what the devil did in the Garden of Eden. God was not surprised about what choices you would make, the lives that you would choose to live. God is not surprised by the things that we allow in our lives. God is not surprised by our emptiness. God has made a plan for that emptiness to be healed, for that emptiness to be filled with him. God has had a plan even before any of us were even in the picture. God had a plan to send his son, Jesus, to be our salvation. And the empty tomb confirms God's eternal plan of his redemptive plan for our lives. I love the way that David, Paul David Tripp says this, the empty tomb is a promise that God will never leave his redemptive work half done. God doesn't go part way and then take a break. God never stops. He never rests. He has worked continuously in your life, in my life, drawing us towards him, working a plan in our lives. And the fact that the empty tomb is empty is proof that God will never stop his redemptive work in our lives. The last thing that we see here in this story is that the risen Jesus turns fear into worship. I love the way that verse 9 reads here. Imagine for a moment you were going to visit someone who had passed away, a loved one, and you were fully expecting to find their remains, their bones, their body laid to rest, and you find anything but that. Imagine how confusing that would be, how difficult that would be to wrap your mind around it. The Marys, they went through the whole grief cycle in the period of about an hour here, They were hurting, mourning, grieving. They turned that into anger and fear and frustration only to come full circle around to joy. And it says this in verse 9. It says, suddenly Jesus met them as if it's a really normal thing to see a dead person walking alive. And Jesus greets them by simply saying to them, greetings. I can't imagine what was going through the mind of Jesus as he just showed up on the scene to see the Marys. And he says to them, greetings. And it says that they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. This is such an odd and peculiar, pe- peculiar thing to, to hear the Marys do. If, if I saw someone who I desperately wanted to see again, and they were alive before me, I would run up to them, 
And I would wrap my arms around them. I, I would smother them with kisses. I, I would hug them to the point where they were done with the hug, but it was just getting awkward and I still wanted to hug more, right? I, I wouldn't let them go for anything. And yet when the Marys see Jesus, they don't run up to him and wrap their arms around him. They don't run up to him and kiss him and, and just cry and share their joy. They run up to him and they drop to his feet and they grab his feet and they hug them. And it would be easy to think that's the weirdest thing in the world, except for what they were doing was they were acknowledging the royalty of Jesus. They were acknowledging that this wasn't just somebody, this was King Jesus. And he deserved their worship and admiration. He deserved their honor as they dropped to the feet of Jesus and grasped his feet and worshiped him. Let's be honest, the thought of dead people coming back from the grave tends to make most feel fear. Hollywood and camp counselors have made their bread and butter on telling a good ghost story. But this isn't just anyone who came back from the dead. This is Jesus, the Son of God and man, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Great Healer, the Savior, the Defender, the Lamb who was slain. This is King Jesus. It would be very appropriate to hear at least an amen there. Everything changed when Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus not only paid the price for our sin with his life, but he also broke the power of sin, of death in our life. It wasn't enough for Jesus just to live a perfect sinless life, which he did and we couldn't. It wasn't enough for Jesus just to go to the cross and die the death that you and I were supposed to suffer, but didn't. No, it was his resurrection from the dead that fulfilled all that he came to do to redeem us from our sin and restore us back to God. And that is why the Marys moved from fear to worship. The emptiness of the tomb loomed heavy in their hearts, but the sight of the risen Jesus filled them with life that led to worship. I said at the beginning that the one thought that I hope that you take away from this morning as you spend the rest of Easter, as you go into your week, is that Jesus takes away the empty and fills it with life. It's close to one the, the thought that I want you to hold, but there's a word missing. See, Jesus isn't just interested in filling your life with just anything. Jesus takes away the empty and he fills it with his life. Because his life is the only thing that will satisfy the emptiness that we have. Jesus doesn't just fill our emptiness with some possession or accomplishment or another human relationship or some earthly experience. None of that will make us whole. Some of us are sitting here right now thinking, if I just have this for dessert today, I will be made whole. If I just get along with this person, I will be made whole. If I just get this praise at work, I will be made whole. If I receive this grade at this school, I will be made whole. None of that matters. All of that's going to fade away. All of it's going to fall short of what Jesus has to offer us, and that's his life. The only thing. The only one who can make us whole is Jesus. And that is why he fills our emptiness with his life. Paul wrote this in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Paul's talking about the, the realm of evil. He's talking about Satan. He's talking about us living in sin. He says... In verse 3, that all of us, every single person, every single one in here, you can look to your left or your right, you can hold a mirror to yourself, every single person in this room, Paul now speaks to all of us, and every single person who's outside of this room, he says, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even while we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace that we have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. 
Jesus doesn't save us just so that we can go back to the old life of living. Jesus saves us so that we can live new and afresh in his life, in his freedom, having the penalty of sin broken in our life and the power of sin broken in our life. He doesn't want us to go back to our mess. He wants us to move forward into the life that he purchased for us with his own blood. And that is for every single person. Whatever it is that you're living for today, it's going to fail you. It's going to fail you. You will wake up someday and you will either forget what it is or you'll be disappointed by the fact that it hasn't filled that emptiness inside you. But Jesus won't. Jesus never will. Jesus can fill that wholeness in you this morning. In a few hours, I'm going to go home and I'm going to do what a lot of parents do, a lot of households do, and we are going to have an Easter egg hunt at our home. It's probably going to happen after I get a nap, hopefully. But I'm going to go out into our yard and I'm going to take, I don't know, a couple hundred eggs that last night Angela and I spent stuffing for our kids, and we're going to scatter them all over the yards. And they're going to come out and they're going to run. It's amazing. I have three daughters, and one of them is going to graduate high school in just a little over a year. And she reverts, even she reverts to like a three-year-old child. It's like, like, these can only hold so much candy, and yet they just think that this is the greatest thing ever. And yet last night as I was stuffing eggs, I discovered there was like a dozen eggs with like last year's candy in it. We're hiding those ones too. They don't know it. And as they run out of our house and they search the yard and they gather these eggs, they, they, they hold these as treasures. And inevitably, from time to time, there's an egg that I've missed. And when they open the egg, they discover that there's nothing in the egg. And it's amazing to watch their response to that. They look at it, they take it, and they toss it because they can't be bothered by it. It's not, it doesn't have what they want. They, they're not content with it. They, they don't want the empty egg. They want the full egg with all 15 pieces of jelly beans in it. I don't, like that's all that matters to them. And I got thinking about the empty egg. You know, I think the empty egg is actually a better image for Easter than any full egg. Because it's the empty tomb that actually means life for us. I think it would be great for every parent just to enjoy some personal satisfaction of seeing the response, but also to teach a biblical lesson too. Why can't both happen at the same time? For there to be an empty egg every time you do an Easter egg hunt. What better way to teach our kids that none of the full eggs matter in comparison to the empty one? You see, if Mary and Mary had gone to the tomb and found anything in there, it would have meant that none of this matters. But because they went and discovered nothing, it meant that they received everything. That's what the empty egg, the empty tomb does for us. I want to call the worship team to come on up. The truth is, is that this world is trying to convince us all the time that our emptiness can be filled by someone or something, some experience, something that we can find in this life. But none of that will ever satisfy. None of that will ever last. None of that will ever matter. The only thing that does and will is Jesus. There are some here, I, I know many of you well, I, I see you and some of you have been walking with Jesus for a long time. A long time ago, you you received the good news of the gospel. You heard that you were a sinner lost in need of a savior. And the good news is that Jesus came to save you. And you, you received that forgiveness of your sins. You acknowledged that you had made mistakes and you had sin in your life. And you acknowledged that you needed the forgiveness of Jesus. And you received it and you gave control of your life over to him. And you've been walking with Jesus. But over time, you've bought into the lie that something shiny or something special or someone can actually replace Jesus and slowly but surely over time you've chosen something this earth has to offer instead of what Jesus has to offer. I want to remind you that that thing or person or accolade, it's, it's going to fail. And the invitation for you this morning is this, is to invite Jesus to fill that emptiness in your life once again. 
For some of us here this morning, we don't need Jesus all over again. We already have him. We just need to make sure that Jesus is on the throne of our lives. And so in a few moments, I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite you not to worry about Easter dinner or family gatherings or getting home to have a nap or anything else that might come afterwards, but that you would take opportunity right now to reestablish Jesus back on the throne of your life. For some of you here, you're here for a lot of different reasons. You're probably counting down the moments. You probably wish that I had a five-minute sermon, not a 25-minute sermon. It doesn't matter what got you here. What matters is, is you have an opportunity right now. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. You know it because you've heard him before. And he's saying to you that whatever it is that you're living for, it's just going to fail you. And some of us, we've been learning that lesson over and over and over again, and we have not yet come to the place where we have given control of our lives over to Jesus. I'm going to pray for you as well. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. But if we don't give the opportunity for people to receive Jesus and receive forgiveness of their sins, then what is the point of all this? The reason why it matters that Jesus is risen is because he's here to save us. We can't save ourselves. Only he can save us. And so I'm inviting you to let go of control in your life, to simply say, I'm a sinner, and I need your forgiveness, God. Here's the good news. Every single person in this room is a sinner, saved by God's grace, including myself. We're all sinners, and none of us would get to experience eternity with God if it weren't for his son Jesus in our lives. So don't worry if you feel like you're the only one. You're not. If Mary Magdalene can be emptied of the demons in her life and receive fullness of Jesus in replacement of that, then surely you can be emptied of whatever it is that is taking up root in your life and receive the fullness of Jesus in your life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that we get to celebrate the life and resurrection of Jesus Christ that you didn't leave your son in some tomb somewhere, that you didn't half finish the job, but that you took it all the way. Jesus, thank you for going to the cross on our behalf, for living the life that we should have lived, dying the death that we should have died, that you didn't stay dead, but that you went into hell, that you took the keys from Satan, that you conquered death, and because of that, you've conquered everything. You've conquered everyone, and you are alive and well, and we can have freedom from sin and the penalty and the power of sin in our lives. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being alive and making it possible for us to walk forward in that freedom. Thank you for going and being your father and creating a place for us to come and spend eternity with you someday. And I thank you that this morning it's not too late. It is not too late to give you control of our lives. It's not too late to say, I have an emptiness inside of me, Jesus, that needs to be filled. Will you come and fill it with your life? Jesus, thank you for making that possible. And if you're here this morning, and you fall into that first category of people. You've, you've already given your life to Jesus, but over time you have, you have just slowly but surely allowed something or someone else to creep into your life. I'm going to invite you to pray this with me as I pray. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. I know that I have turned my eyes from Jesus onto something or someone else. And right now I confess that to you, God. And I ask you to forgive me of it. And Jesus, I ask that you would take control of my life and reign on the throne of my life once again. And if you're here this morning and, and you fall into that second group of people, which We've all been there before. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you're tired of living that life of emptiness and you want freedom and you want fullness of life, then I'm gonna ask that you pray this with me. Father, I'm a sinner. And I need your forgiveness. Please forgive me for the sin that I've committed. Jesus, wash me and make me new. 
take the emptiness that exists in me and fill me with you, Jesus. And help me to walk forward in your freedom. God, I ask that you would receive these prayers. I ask that you would continue the work that you've already started in so many lives. And I pray that today, as as people gather with family and with friends, that the talk wouldn't be about the food or the candy or the traditions, but the talk would be about the work that you're that you've done and that you are doing in people's lives. I pray that you would help those who prayed those prayers to seek out others, to share with others that they prayed those prayers this morning. And I ask God that they wouldn't just be words, but that you would move them into action, that you would fill them right now with your presence, that you would help them to experience a life that maybe we've never experienced before because you've removed the emptiness and you've refilled it with your presence, God. We thank you for this. In your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us as we worship and declare praise to Jesus together? I search the world, but it could. Treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's no Better than you, Lord, there. 
I was a kid, I loved to be driving down the highway with my dad driving the car, and I'd roll down the window, and I would stick my head out the window, and I, I'd just get a face full of air, right? It would it'd be so powerful that I would, like, stop breathing. Like, I couldn't take in the oxygen. God has been breathing his breath into creation from since the beginning of time. He's been creating people. He's been raising dead armies to life. And he has been restoring people back to him. God wants to breathe his breath of life into you. He wants to fill you of your emptiness and fill you with Jesus. He wants to reconcile you back to him. I hope this Easter that you will just let go of control of your life and give it over to him and experience the life that he's actually created you for. We have a prayer corner at the back and we have some people who would love to pray with you and for you and over you. I can't think of a better time. You know, dinner will wait. The Easter egg hunts will wait. They can't do it without you. So take time, be prayed for, receive prayer. And share with one another if you took time this morning to reestablish Jesus on the throne of your life. Thank you for worshiping Jesus here with us today. I hope that you go home and go wherever you're going and continue to worship him because he is worthy of our worship and praise. Have a great Easter. We'll see you next Sunday. You're dismissed. God sent his son.